factorial designs. Factorial designs are experimental designs that involve more than one independent variable. And in this unit, which is our last problem solving unit, we will do some math, but in a much more limited way than uh, we've done in the past two sections. But as usual, we have a very short amount of time to complete this unit. And we're also getting started simultaneously on the writing portion of the course. So it's very important that between now and the end of the semester, you do not miss class. And do not skip lab. Um, because, for example, today you're going to be doing exam review, you're going to be talking about the article you're going to be writing your first paper about, and having a chance to ask questions about it, uh, and getting the overview of the first writing assignment. So, you know, things are happening, we're trying to give people enough advance notice so they can get things done. If they need help with writing, they'll have a chance to work on a draft and get help at the writing center, uh, work with a tutor, so that you have the best chance of doing well in the writing portion of the course. Uh, but please do not put things off. Uh, the article worksheet that's due next Tuesday is already posted. I would encourage you to get online, download it, and get that article worksheet uh, done uh, sooner rather than later because problem set number four is also going up and it's also due next Tuesday. Uh, and that's going to take you a bit longer. So you want to make sure that you get things done as early as you can so that you have as much time as possible to get help if you're not sure what's going on. But you will have exam number four in fairly short order, whether we're just starting today and you're getting exam three back. But I'm not too worried about you guys. An average of 88% on the last test. Well done. Okay. I see some very proud faces in the class who did very well. So you should feel proud. I know students here are working really hard. Um, all right. So factorial designs are those designs that let us study multiple independent variables at the same time. Why would we want to do that? Well, because in the real world, variables you know, don't affect us independently. For example, you might be able to talk on your cell phone and drive your car, no problem. You might be able to drive on a road you don't know without getting into an accident, no problem. You might be able to drive when you're a little bit sleepy and not get into an accident. No problem. But when combinations of these things hit you all at the same time, so for example, you're really sleepy, the road quality is poor, and you haven't been taking care of your tires or your brakes, now the likelihood that you're actually going to get into an accident goes up because you basically are going to max out your ability to address problems that arise. So, you know, in the real world, behaviors are the result of combinations of variables. They're not the result of one thing causing us to do another thing. So if we want our research to more accurately reflect what's happening in the world, we have to kick it up a notch in complexity and start to conduct experiments that involve multiple independent variables. Now in 3510, you already talked about some studies that involve having multiple dependent variables. You can do that with things like correlation and regression, where you might have multiple dependent variables and look to see what the connections are between them. Well, in factorial designs, we look to see what the connections are between independent variables and how they might influence each other. Now, factorial designs not only allow us to explore how variables combine in the real world, which is nice, but they allow us to be more systematic, more thoughtful, more controlled about the way we address the challenges of the scientific method. So, for example, we know that the number one challenge of creating a between subjects design is making sure that my groups are similar enough to compare. I don't want groups to be so different that a significant result at the end could be the result of a compound, not the result of my manipulation. So sometimes, as a way to address this, we choose 
to do things like restrict the range of variation or hold variables constant that we otherwise can't control because we're worried about variation. For example, I might want to do a study on uh, college students and some behavior about college students. And I might choose, on that circumstance, to restrict the range of the age of my subjects because I'm concerned that college students who are in the traditional age zone of 18 to 22 might behave differently than non-traditional students who are in their 40s, 50s, or 60s with regard to whatever my variable is. And so I don't, I'm worried that I'm not going to have very many non-traditional students, and so I might not be able to get an even number of non-traditional students in my different categories. So I might choose to restrict the range of variation and just study students who are between the ages of 18 and 22. And while that's a perfectly fine thing to do, you certainly can do it, it's not a problem, what it does do is exclude a subset of the population that is actually described by my variable of college students, or my participant group of college students. So I really, you know, one thing I can do is that I can use factorial designs to let me get around that. I can instead say, you know what? How about if I make age an independent variable? So now I'm going to do this study I was going to do before, but I'm going to add another independent variable, and I'm going to make age that variable. Now I'm going to compare, I'm going to have one level of age be 18 to 22, another level be 30 to 40, and at another level be 50 to 60. Okay, so now I'm looking at young, middle-aged, and older college students, and I can actually examine how those different groups respond to whatever other manipulation I was interested in and see if they really do differ. Because you know I was excluding the older, middle-aged and older students because I thought they might be different, well, now I can actually put in an independent variable and find out if they really are different. And if it turns out they are, well, that gives me some more questions to ask, more questions to explore. If it turns out they're not, well, now I know it doesn't matter. And in future studies, I can actually include people from those non-traditional age groups, and they're not going to have some kind of different reaction to my other variable compared to traditionally aged students. So I can use that to take an extraneous variable that I otherwise might have had to, you know, try not to control, and literally control it as much as possible by creating a new IV. Now, with within subjects designs, our biggest concern is sequence effects. We're worried that the order in which our subjects experience the conditions could influence how they respond to those conditions. We're worried about things like learning, practice effects, fatigue effects, stuff like that. So, if I want, really want to know if order matters, well, I can just make order an IV. So I can do whatever study I was going to do before, and then I can put order in as another IV and actually have each level be a different order of the conditions. Then I can actually do math to see, you know, are there any significant differences between the different orders in my study? And if it turns out that, in fact, there are no significant differences, then I can say, you know what, I can show you statistically there are no sequence effects in this study. The counterbalancing was effective, and now we can just put all the groups together. And we have much bigger groups for comparison, which gives us more statistical power. So yay. And if it turns out that order does matter, then I can say, well, hey, why would order matter? Why does it matter if you eat chunks and lumps before Kroger, but not Kroger before chunks and lumps, for example? Why would that matter? So then you can explore why you might get that anomalous order effect and you can address it, knowing that counterbalancing wasn't effective. So you don't want to use it under these circumstances. You can also do things that you can't do with just single factors. You can combine types of variables that we've either had, we've always had either or, right? We've either had manipulated variables or subject variables, or between subjects variables or within subjects variables. And now it's not like that. Now I can have a study that has a subject variable and a manipulated variable or a between subjects variable and a within subjects variable. So now I can do combinations of things I couldn't do before, uh, which allows me to explore human and animal behavior in a much more realistic and generalized way. So just as an example, I'll give you some visuals to go with those descriptions. You guys remember we talked about, I beat this into your head early on this semester, we talked about my experiment where I had a group of bulldogs and I uh, 
had Chunks and Lumps, Purina One, and Kroger Kibble, and we had the dogs eat the food, and we could do this either as a between subjects design or within subjects design, where I either had different groups of dogs eat Chunks and Lumps as a Purina One, as a Kroger Kibble, so that was the between subjects version, or I could do it within subjects where I had all the dogs eat all the foods, and I just counterbalance the orders and look to see if they liked one more than the other. So here's a single factor design, right? One IV, the IV here is the food type. And one DV, how many cups do they eat on average? So I can now modify this, whether I do it between, whether I do it within, let me show you. So here now, let's say I was worried that my bulldogs, as awesome as they are, might not be representative of all breeds of dogs. They're roughly a medium-sized breed of dog. They range in between 45 and 65 pounds. Um, but there are certainly much smaller dogs, lots of many smaller dogs, and many much larger dogs. And it could be that the size of the dog, different breeds of dogs, um, like different foods. So what if I add breed to my study? So now I have my IV of food, and I have my IV of breed. Right? So now I've got both. So now for each food, I actually have three bars. One bar for small dogs, one bar for medium-sized dogs, and one bar for large dogs. So now I can look to see. Well, I mean, I would expect, for example, that small dogs are going to eat less than medium dogs, and medium dogs are going to eat less than large dogs. And in fact, that's what we see on the graph, right? That's why the green bars are always shorter than the orange bars, and the orange bars are always shorter than the yellow bars. So that's not surprising. So I, you know, I would expect that. But what I'm really curious about is, does it matter what breed of dog is eating what food? Okay. Does any special combination make a difference? And if I look at these, if I look at this graph, it looks like no, it actually doesn't matter. And here's why I say that: because it's always the case that if I look at the green bars across all the foods, the chunks and lumps bar is always highest, and the Purina bar is always second highest, and the Kroger bar is lowest. And that's true for medium dogs, and it's true for large dogs. So what I know from looking at this graph is that it doesn't make any difference at all what breed of dog. I was right in the beginning, chunks and lumps is the best food. Okay. But I was able to do it here with two, I could do this between, and I could do this within, or I could do this between and this between. Doesn't matter, either way would work. Now let's think about that adding a within subjects variable. Remember if I'm worried about order effects, so let's say that I'm doing a study and I'm comparing the three types of food, and I want to find out if order matters. So, okay, here I've got within subjects, I'm going to have the dogs eat all three foods in some order, and what I've got up here are three orders, Latin square orders, right? I pick a subset of the possible orders, because I have three times two times one possible random orders of my three conditions, and so I pick three. Chunks, Purina, Kroger is the green bars, Purina, Kroger chunks, the orange bars, and Kroger chunks Purina is the yellow bars. So what we're looking at now is we've got chunks and lumps when it was eaten first, second, and third, and then Purina one when it was eaten second, first, and third, and Kroger pickle when it was eaten third, second, and first. And if you look at the bars, you can see that, yeah, there's a little bit of variation for each type of food. But in general, the bars for chunks and lumps are highest, the bars for Purina 1 are in the middle, and the bars for Kroger Kibble are lowest. And, you know, yeah, we see some variation here, but this is probably not enough variation to be meaningful. We expect some variation in what the dogs eat. But it looks like, if we look at this graph, that's probably not the case that the order in which they eat the food, foods matters that much. What they really seem to care about is what the food is. And they like chunks and lumps best, followed by Purina 1, followed by Kroger Kill. Or store brand can be work. Does anybody have any questions about those two things? Did you see how I can add in another variable and get some more information to see if my experiment's actually working the way I wanted to? Alright, so when we do these kinds of changes, Factorial designs are allowing us to build on previous research. So I, could, I took a study that was a much simpler study, one IV, one DV, 
And then I could expand on it, explore. I could add different breeds of dogs. I could add different sexes of dogs. I could add uh, eating at different times a day. I could add um, dogs that were healthy versus dogs that were sick, dogs that were fat versus dogs that were normal weight. I could do all kinds of things to build on my chunks and lumps dog food study to find out the breadth of the appeal of chunks and lumps as a new dog food. So it allows me to explore the external validity of my finding. How, how broad of a claim can I make about the awesomeness of chunks and lumps? I mean, is it just, is it the dog food for bulldogs or is it the dog food for all dogs? Right? And what's the evidence that I have that that's true? Um, I'm also able to identify moderating variables. In other words, I might know that there's an effect, but I want to find out how broadly does this effect occur? Are there limitations to this effect? Does it occur only for certain groups? So there's an example from your text that I really like, so we're going to use it because it's similar to some other examples that I have for you today. And uh, the experiment that they talk about in the book involves uh, taking, first they talk about the single factor experiment, just one IV, where researchers had people come into the lab, had men come into the lab, and they got half of them drunk, and the other half uh, drank a uh, beverage that smelled like alcohol and tasted like alcohol, but didn't actually have alcohol in it. So they had a drunk group and a placebo group, and the people did not know which group they were in. They were naive. They couldn't tell the difference between the alcoholic beverage and the non-alcoholic beverage. So they didn't know what they were getting. And then what the researchers did was they had the participants have the opportunity to uh, shock a confederate. Now, of course, the confederate, this is somebody who works for the researcher, was not really shocked. This person is an actor, just like in the famous Milgram study. So they were trained to act like they were being shocked when in fact they weren't really being shocked. And they were doing things to piss off the person that were in a script, right? So they're doing exactly what they're supposed to do, very systematic antagonizing of the drunk people and the sober people. And then the people had the opportunity to shock them when they did something that they found annoying. I know there are times when I would like to do that, to shock people that I find annoying. Like, can I just put a taser on my car and the dashboard and then if somebody cuts me off, just, you know, and it like turns off all, that wouldn't be great. I can think of so many marvelous applications. It'd be really dangerous, but it would be very satisfying. Okay, clearly I'm in the meme placebo group, right? <laughs> All right, so they said, well, you know what, we have an idea. Maybe it's not just that all people who drink shock more than people who don't drink. So maybe it's not just that getting drunk makes you mean. Maybe there are certain subsets of people who get mean when they're drunk and certain subsets of people who don't get mean when they're drunk. So they added in a variable which was the size of the participants. They had small men and big men. Okay, so light men, heavy men. And they, so they divided them up, and they then got half of the light men drunk and kept half of them sober, and they got half of the heavy men drunk and kept half of them sober. And what they found was that there wasn't much difference between light men and heavy men when they were sober in terms of how much they would shock Men would just shock people for pissing them off, and they were okay with that. But when it came time to deal with the drunk people, the large men were much more likely to administer a more severe shock than the small men. So what does this mean? It means that there's something happening with size and drunkenness. Those two variables work together in an interesting way to affect how aggressive people are or how aggressive men are when they drink. So we see that alcohol affects men's aggression differently depending on their size. Small men, when they get drunk, don't get as aggressive as large men when they get drunk. This means that body weight moderates the effect of alcohol on aggression. How big you are influences whether or not you're going to get more aggressive or how aggressive you get when you're drunk. And then the theoretical question is, why might that be true? Why might smaller drunk men not get as mean as big drunk men? 
And maybe the answer is smaller drunk men can get themselves into trouble with big drunk men that they can't get out of. Right? If smaller men get drunk and get mean and start causing fights, big drunk men are going to kick their butts. But big drunk men can just lumber around like, you know, hulks, and if they're big and drunk, well, they can get away with more, right? So they're not necessarily curtailed in the way, they might not have ever learned that being big and drunk is as bad as someone small has learned that being small and drunk is bad, right? You know? And so, who knows? Um, we hypothesized in the other class that maybe we would see a different effect for women. They said, no, it's the small women that are meek when they're drunk. <laughs> Big women, no, small women are the mean ones. So we would say, well, look, well, there you go. We could say that maybe sex moderates your aggression, right? So if there's an interaction between your sex and your size and alcohol and aggression. So who knows? It could get very complicated. But I mean, these are questions we can ask with factorial design. So when we talk about factorial designs, when we talk about them in papers, we talk about them in class. We're going to talk about them in terms of factorial notation and design type. So two things we're always going to have to be able to identify about the designs, the notation and the design type. And to be able to identify the designs in terms of these characteristics, you're going to need to be able to identify several things. You have to be able to tell from the description how many IVs there are. And now it's not just one. Now it could be two, it could be three. You have to be able to tell from the description how many there are. You have to be able to identify what the levels of all the IVs are. You have to be able to tell for each IV. Is it between subjects or within subjects? Is it a manipulated variable or a subject variable? Other things you have to be able to figure out. You have to know. If we're talking about a manipulated variable that's between subjects. You have to know whether it's they used random assignment to put people into the groups, or they used a matching procedure first. If it's a subject variable, these things don't matter. If it's a within subjects variable, you need to know, is it a complete design or an incomplete design? Did they use full counterbalancing or partial counterbalancing? You guys remember the difference between a complete and incomplete within subjects design? We're talking all the way back to exam one, and it's back, and it's going to be on this exam too. So, what's the difference between a complete within subjects design and an incomplete within subjects design? Is it incomplete, they don't experience all the conditions in every order, and complete, everyone experiences all the conditions in every order? Not quite. There is an issue of, part of the issue with complete or incomplete is about what the subjects experience. Now we know this is a within sub subjects design, so all of the subjects are experiencing all the conditions. So if it's complete, what does that mean? What do they experience? They experience all the conditions, what? Hmm? More than once. More than once. They experience them more than once. If it's an incomplete design, each subject experiences them only one time. So you, can't, you don't end up doing multiple blocks which you, with each subject in a complete design. In an incomplete design, you just do one block. In an incomplete design, one block for each subject. Complete design, at least two blocks. For what's full or partial counterbalancing? Now we're getting to orders. Full counterbalancing means the study fully counterbalanced the orders. All of the possible random orders of the conditions have data. You gather data for all of those possible random orders. If you do partial counterbalancing, some of them. And this is where you might choose to use a Latin square or some other systematic subset of the orders in order to get as much counterbalancing as you can given that you're not gathering data on all the possible orders. So from the description, you have to be able to tell because it's going to influence what kind of design you have. All right, so for example, let's say we want to do a study. Uh, we're going to test, we're going to design an experiment to test that idea, that famous idea that we all learn in college, that if you get really drunk and you have to drive home, 
you can slam a bunch of caffeine and sober yourself up, and you will be you'll be as if you were not drunk, right? And this makes total sense, right? Because you learn in drugs and behavior that alcohol is a depressant, so it could slow your reaction time, whereas caffeine is a stimulant. So what you're hoping for is that your system is depressed because of the alcohol, and what you're going to do is ramp it back up to normal with some caffeine so that you can respond normally when you get behind the wheel and not swerve and not miss turns and not miss stop signs and not get pulled over and not kill yourself or others. Well, we could do an experiment. We could say, all right, well, let's take that uh, drunk, not drunk division that we saw before. And then we're going to split that up. Now we're going to add another variable of caffeine. So we're going to give people 400 milligrams of caffeine. That's like two cups of strong coffee. So two cups of coffee, one cup of coffee, no coffee. And this variable, the first one, has two levels, drunk and not drunk. It's a between subjects variable because you can't simultaneously, you can't be drunk and then not drunk, right? That's, everybody's either going to be one or the other. It's a manipulated variable because I can randomly assign people to be in either the drunk condition or the sober condition. And it's random assignment because that is our default assumption. Unless you're given specific information that a matching variable was used, assume random assignment because that's what we would always want to do if we have the opportunity to do so. If not, they have to say so. So we've got two levels between subjects, manipulated variable with random assignment. And then we get to caffeine. It's got three levels between subjects, because again, you can't simultaneously drink two cups of coffee, one cup of coffee, and no coffee. And you can't counterbalance them if you have people drink all of them, right? It's manipulated, random assignment. So I would look at this, and I would say, that's a two by three random groups factorial design. Now how did I get that? This is how I got that. The 2 by 3 part comes from the number of IVs and the number of levels they have. I have two numbers, 2 and 3, because I have two IVs. I have one of the IVs, the first one I mentioned, has two levels. So that's why the first number is 2. The second IV I mentioned has three levels. That's why the second number is three. So when I say I have a two by three design, you know right away that there were two IVs in my study, one of them had two levels, and one of them had three levels. What this also means is that you instantly know that my study had six different conditions. Two times three conditions. How do you know that? Well, there's alcohol and no alcohol. On the left and across the top, I've got zero milligrams of caffeine, 200 milligrams of caffeine, 400 milligrams of caffeine. That means there are six possible combinations of conditions in my study. I could, I could be drunk, and get no caffeine. I could be drunk and get a cup of coffee. I could be drunk and get two cups of coffee. Or I could be sober and get no coffee. I could be sober and get one cup of coffee, or I could be sober and get two cups of coffee. So there's six possible combinations of the conditions that I've defined for my study. Now, the fact that it's random groups, I know, because random assignment was used from all of the variables. I randomly assign subjects to the conditions, so these groups are randomly generated. Totally randomly generated conditions. Everybody had an equal shot of being in any one of those six conditions. And then factorial design, because it has more than one ID. Any design that has more than one ID is referred to as a factorial design. So just by looking at this statement, if someone said, oh yeah, I ran an experiment with a two by three random groups factorial design, I automatically know it had two independent variables, one had two levels, one had three. Random assignment was used between subjects. I know all of that just from that description. Because only a study that had 
two independent variables from only two levels, only three levels, where both subjects were between subjects and both used random assignment would be called a two by three random groups factorial. So that's where the flowchart comes in. Because there are actually a lot of different kinds of designs. All right, so take a look at your flowchart just for a second. Okay, and your flowchart isn't color coded in this pretty way like mine. But you can color code it at home if you prefer, if you like color coding. Um, on your chart, the things that are marked in blue, those are designs that have between subjects variables. All between subjects variables. Over there on that side, all the ones that are marked in red, those are all within subjects variables. And the ones in the middle are ones where we have combinations that we haven't been able to do before. And you can find where you are by just looking at the first choice you have once you come out of the top of the flowchart. All between subjects variables, head down here. At least one between and one within, head down the middle. All within subjects variables, head over to the right side. Okay. So you will need to know this flowchart for the test. You will have to know all of these different types and be able to recognize them, know what the characteristics are of the different types of factorial designs for the test. There aren't a lot of formulas that you need to know, but you do need to know the flowchart. Yeah? The line between at least one manipulated and one perfect and subject is the one bottom blue or purple. It's actually both because there are different options that lead to the same kind of design so sneaky. But this color-coded version is up online, so if you want to take a look at your version online, you can see just, they don't like us using the color for the department because the is so expensive. And they love you, but not to do the color. So you get colorful professor and colorful slides, but you have to print out at home and color you on the color version. All right, so my first choice was all between subjects, right, up here. Because for that one, we had all between subjects, right? Alcohol was between subjects and caffeine was between subjects. And it says, are the IVs manipulated or subject variables? We said they're both manipulated. Okay, so we move over here to this box. Then it says, how are the subjects assigned to the different conditions? Do you use random assignment or matching? Random assignment. That means it's a random groups factorial. It's a random groups factorial design. Other possibilities are a matched groups factorial. That's where either one of the variables, any one of the variables involves matching. Then we call it a matched groups factorial. Even if the other one was random assignment, if any one of the between subjects variables has matching, we call it a matched groups factorial because there was intervention prior to the random assignment in some case. The third possibility over here is a natural groups factorial. That's where the variables are all subject variables. So you're talking about naturally existing groups. So for example, if I had one variable that was size and another variable that was race and ethnicity. So I could have light white men and heavy white men. And light African American men and heavy African American men. And light Hispanic men and heavy Hispanic men, for example. And all of those, those are naturally existing groups, right? I don't get to randomly assign people their size or their race and ethnicity. So we're talking about naturally existing groups that were being compared at that point. So that's how I've made that decision. So let's take a look at another example here. When you take a look at your flowchart, and given this information that I've got one IV that's breed of dog, three levels between subjects and a subject variable, right? Because you can't be more than one breed and be a purebred, and I can't randomly assign the dogs their breed. So this is a between subject, subject variable. And the other one is type of food. We're gonna do this one within, okay? So three levels within subjects. It's a manipulated variable because I can randomly order the conditions for the subjects. I can do counterbalancing in this case. So it's a manipulated variable. And I'm going to use complete counterbalancing, A, B, B, A. Right? If you remember that, that's where I give them one block order in and the reverse block order out. So each subject experiences each condition twice. And I have counterbalancing done within 
subjects. Okay, so given this information, between subjects, subject variable with three levels, and a within subjects manipulated variable with complete counterbalancing and three levels, what do we have if we look at the chart? Let's walk through it. So where do I go first? All between, at least one between, one within, or all within? Mm -hmm. At least one between, one within. So I'm in the purple zone now. So I'm going to come up with one of the purple answers. So it says, is the between subject variable a manipulated or a subject variable? It's a subject variable, right? Dog breed. Okay, it's a subject variable. And the answer is subject variable, so I come here, and then I follow that down. It takes me down to the chart and gets, brings me to something called a P times E, or a P and E, factorial design. Now, what does that mean? Well, the P stands for participant variable, which is another name for a subject variable. So P is for participant variable. And E stands for environmental variable. And this is to indicate that I have a subject variable in one case and a manipulated variable in the other case. So P and E factorials are those that always have one subject variable and one manipulated variable. So if I have one subject variable, one manipulated variable, that's a P and E factorial design, a participant by environment factorial design. But we just say P and E. Now you'll notice this is the only one on the chart that has multiple tracks that will take you to it. And that's because there are different ways to get one manipulated and one subject. I could have, they could both be between subjects and one's manipulated and one subject. Or I could have one between and one within and one's manipulated and one subject. And truth be told, you can actually do it within subjects variables too, but it's very, very rare. It doesn't happen very long. So um, anytime you have a subject variable and a manipulated variable in your study, you're talking about a P and E factorial design. Now this contrasts with the other new kind we've never talked about before, which is a mixed factorial, and that's where you have one between and one within, but both of them are manipulated. Okay, so if you have one between and one within, and both are manipulated, then you've got a mixed factorial design. So you will practice on the problem set identifying studies in terms of their factorial notation and design using this chart. And you'll have to do that on the test and on the final. So we've decided this is a P and E factorial design. What's my factorial notation? Three by three. So this is a three by three P and E factorial design. You can write that in the blank. If you have the slides printed out, you can write that in the blank. It's a 3 by 3 P and E factorial design. Now, I'm giving you all the parts up here, but of course on the problem set, I just give you descriptions like I always do, and you have to figure out the parts yourself. And that's how it would be on the test. So, let's go back to our beverage study now. So we've got an experiment with two IVs, it's a two by three, random groups, factorial design, and it's got six different conditions. Now because there are six different conditions, this means that I'm actually gonna have six different means in the study. Okay, I'm gonna have an average for people who had no alcohol and no caffeine, an average for people who had no alcohol and one cup of coffee, an average for people who had no alcohol and two cups of coffee, and so forth. I'm going to have an average response time for every possible combination. So now instead of having two scores to compare, or two means to compare, or three means to compare, the pretty much the minimum number I'm ever going to have is four, if I have a two by two design, right? <coughs> four, six, eight, nine, lots and lots of combinations. Now, when we do analysis for a factorial design, we do two different things. Okay, we look for two different things. 
We do F tests still. So factorial and uh, factorial ANOVA still involves doing F tests. The difference is that we do an F test for each independent variable and for every combination of those variables. So to begin, we would do an ANOVA on alcohol to see if alcohol has an effect on people's response time. We would do an ANOVA on caffeine to see if caffeine has an effect on people's response time. And we would do an ANOVA on the combination of alcohol and caffeine to see if the combination has an effect on people's response time. So that would mean three F tests, even for the simplest factorial design. This is why we do not do these by hand in class. Because the truth is, nobody ever does that. If you're doing a factorial ANOVA, you're dumping those numbers into SPSS or SAS or some other statistical program, and you're hitting one. Okay. Nobody sits down and hand calculates factorial ANOVA. But you do need to know how to read source tables for these, how to do basic calculations from a means table in a paper, and how to read graphs that were generated from factorial data to determine whether or not you had treatment effects of the individual variables or their combination. So that's what we're going to talk about now. So when we do factorial designs, we look for two kinds of results. Results of individual variables, individual independent variables. We call those main effects. And we look for effects of a combination of variables. We call those interactions. So let's talk about main effects first. A main effect is what we've been talking about all semester. We talk, we've been talking about main effects with t-tests, main effects with one-way ANOVA. Okay. Anytime we're talking about the impact of a single independent variable on a single dependent variable, we're talking about a main effect. So main effect happens when IV has a significant influence on a DV. If I don't have a significant effect, so that's why I retain the null hypothesis, I don't have a main effect. There's no effect. No main effect. Now, because we have two IVs in our study on drunkenness and caffeine, it's possible that I could have two main effects. I could have a main effect of alcohol, meaning that alcohol influences people's response time, and or I could have a main effect of caffeine, meaning caffeine influences people's response time. I can have as many main effects as I have independent variables. So if a study has three independent variables, there are three possible main effects. If a study has five independent variables, there are five possible main effects. If it has two independent variables, there are two possible main effects. Doesn't I mean you have them, it means that they're possible. It's possible to have a main effect for every single independent variable in the study. What I want you to remember about main effects is that main effects are about individual treatments. They're about the impact of a single IV on a single VV. Now this contrasts with interactions. Interactions are about combinations of treatments. They're about how independent variables influence each other. Does one independent variable moderate the effect of another independent variable? Does it change how it does its job? Does it limit the way it does its job? Does it enhance the way it does its job? So interactions are about combinations of treatments. So, for example, it could be that when we combine alcohol and caffeine, the combination enhances the effect of caffeine. Or it could be that it neutralizes the effect of caffeine, or vice versa. It could be that since we're drinking the alcohol first and then drinking the caffeine, so say I get drunk, I mean the whole idea, what I'm hoping is that, okay, I'm drunk and now I'm drinking coffee, what I'm hoping is that the caffeine is going to negate the effect of the alcohol, right? I'm hoping that 
that depressing effect that slows me down that I get from drinking alcohol is going to be canceled out by the uplift, uplifting, stimulating effect of the caffeine. Of course, another possibility we don't know is that it actually enhances the drunkenness effect. I mean, why on earth do people drink Red Bull and vodka? Why? Because the caffeine might actually accelerate the intake of the alcohol into your system and make you feel drunker faster. Right? Maybe that's your goal. To feel as drunk as possible as quickly as possible. So, what's the combination effect going to be? We don't know. They could affect, they could enhance or suppress each other. We're not sure what the interaction would be. What we do know is that interactions are about combinations of treatments. So you have to have at least two independent variables in play to have an interaction. At least two independent variables in play to have an interaction. So let's take a look at some data. I told you we're going to have six conditions, and that means we have six means. So these are some means. These are some means. These are average response times for each of the conditions. Because this is a random group's factorial design, we know that each one of these represents the performance of a different group of people. Okay. We don't know how many people, I didn't tell you, but these are just made up numbers anyway, so it doesn't matter. <laughs> um, so you've got an average. We know that, for example, people who were legally intoxicated and got no caffeine had an average re response time in the driving simulator of 675 milliseconds to particular driving events. Okay. This may be, did they stop when they were supposed to? Did they change lanes when they were supposed to? Did they avoid other kinds of traffic hazards as they were supposed to? Doesn't matter, it's just whatever we had them do in the driving simulator and whatever we measured their response time to. So we've got 675, 650, 625, 625, 600, 575. Now, what we're going to do is something called calculating marginal means. We're going to do some shortcut calculations to see if it looks like we might have a main effect with our data uh, for either independent variable. So to, to do this for alcohol, what we're going to do is we're going to ignore the levels of caffeine. We don't care about them because we're caring about alcohol right now. We're just interested in comparing the people who were drunk to the people who were sober. Because those are the two levels of alcohol, drunk and sober. So all of the people who drank alcohol, we're going to treat them as one group. And all the people who didn't drink alcohol, we're going to treat as one group. So in order to do this comparison, I needed an average for the alcohol people and an average for the no alcohol people. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to add an average the scores. So I'm going to add the scores for all the alcohol people. I'm going to add 675 plus 650 plus 625. And then I'm going to take the average. I'm going to divide by 3 because I had three conditions. So I'm going to divide by 3. And if I do that, I get a grand average for the alcohol condition of 650. I do the same thing for the no alcohol condition. I add 625, 600, 575, and then divide by 3, because I had three conditions, and I get 600. Now I've got grand averages. I've got an average for my alcohol group and an average for my no alcohol group. And these are the two means that matter if I'm trying to figure out if there's a main effect of alcohol. So now that I've got my averages, I'm going to compare them. So I added, I averaged, and now I'm going to compare. Okay. And I compare those two, and I see that there's an observed difference of 50 milliseconds. So you can think of this as like an HSD observed. So the HSD observed is 50 milliseconds. And just like HSD, this is an absolute value. So we're trying to see the total true distance between these two things, 50. 50 is the difference. So now what we need to know is what is the critical value? What big of a difference is enough for there to be a main effect? And we don't have all the extra 
numbers to actually figure out HSD critical or any other kind of post hoc comparison. So I would just have to give it to you. So if I said, all right, suppose that the critical value here is 30. Do we have a main effect of alcohol? Yes. Yes, we do. Because our critical value is 30, our observed value is 50, the difference is bigger, we're good to go. Okay. What about if I told you the critical value is 60? Do I have a main effect of alcohol? No. No, because my difference is just 50, it's not big enough to count. It's a difference, but it apparently is within the normal variation for behavior. So alcohol doesn't, in fact, impact behavior. Okay. We can do the same thing to do a main effect of caffeine. Okay, now I'm going to absorb, ignore the levels of alcohol, and I'm just going to focus on the levels of caffeine. Now there are three levels for caffeine, 0 milligrams, 200 milligrams, and 400 milligrams. This means that I need to average and get three means. So I need a mean for the 0 milligram people, a mean for the 200 milligram people, and a mean for the 400 milligram people. And to get that, I add an average. So I add 675 and 625, and then divide by 2, because there's two conditions, and I get the average, which is 650. I add 650 and 600, take the average, I get 625. I add 625 and 575, and I take the average, and I get 600. So now I'm looking at these numbers, and I see, well, between 650 and 625, there's a difference of 25. Between 25 and 600, there's a difference of 25. Between 650 and 600, there's a difference of 50. Okay, so this is just like we were doing those post hoc tests, right? Three different observed values, and the question is, what's the critical difference? So if I said, well, the critical difference is 30 then what do you know about these data? You can think of it in HSD terms, if that helps. It's significant between 0 milligrams and 400 milligrams. Mm -hmm. It's not significant between 200 and 400 or 0 and 200. Okay, so I mean, these two are significantly different, but this one's not and this one's not. But as you know, if any of the pair comparisons are significant, that means your F test would be significant too. So there is a main effect here, and the main effect is being driven by the di difference between the 0 milligram group and the 400 milligram group. So what this means is basically, if you're going to drink coffee to change your behavior, to change your reaction time, you need to drink two cups. Drinking one cup isn't going to change your response time in a significant way. But drinking two will do it. So, yeah, but if I give you a critical value and I say the critical difference is 30, yeah, because we've got a, we've got a main effect. Because 650 is 50 apart from 600. That would be big enough to matter. If I told you the critical difference was 60, then no, we wouldn't have any of these comparisons. None of them would be big enough to matter. And in turn, we would say, yeah, there's no main effect of caffeine. So it all matters on what the critical value is and what the observed values are. The observed values you can calculate and the critical value I'll have to give you since we don't have enough other information. Now to figure out if there's an interaction, we use something a little bit different. Okay. For main effects, it was add, average, and compare. That's our, those are our steps. Add for a given condition, take the average, then compare the values across the different conditions for that single independent variable. But for an interaction, we use something called the subtraction method. And in the case of a 2 by 3 design, or a 3 by 2 design, it's easiest to do that math across the variable that has two levels. Because <laughs> then you're just subtracting one number from another. And that's the easiest thing to do. Now, if there are three levels or more, you could do it with all the numbers, but it gets really messy. So, for the purposes of this class, I will never have you do interaction stuff on anything other than a 2 by 3 or a 3 by 2 or a 2 by 2. Because otherwise it just gets complicated. I just want to see if you can do the procedure. I don't need you to be able to do it for every possible case. So the idea is that we're going to subtract. And you have to subtract in the same direction. Meaning that if your first choice is to subtract no alcohol from alcohol, because this number is lower than this number, 
then for every case you have to do it in that direction. Meaning, if I take no alcohol from alcohol for zero milligrams, I have to take no alcohol from alcohol for 200 milligrams, and I have to take no alcohol from alcohol for 400 milligrams. So it matters what direction you do the math in. Now I don't care whether you take the top from the bottom or the bottom from the top, but whichever one you do, you have to do it all the way across. That's the only rule. You have to subtract in the same direction. Don't flip flop. Always subtract. And then you get, you might have negative numbers down here. You might have some positive numbers and some negative numbers. And then you figure out the difference between those positive and negative numbers, and you take that as an absolute value. Okay, so if you had, for example, one of these was negative 25 and one was 50, the difference between them would be 75, the absolute value between the two is 75. Okay. So here, every column is 50. If I compare 50 and 50, no difference. 50 and 50, no difference. 50 and 50, no difference. There's no difference anywhere. So there is absolutely no interaction here. Zero interaction. In order to have an interaction here, I would have to have some observable differences between these pairs. And I don't have any. So here we've got a main effect of alcohol, a main effect of caffeine, but no interaction. Now, let's see what that would look like on a graph. Because one of the things we learned in this unit is how to look at graphs and interpret graphs for the kinds of effects we're talking about. So how can you look at a graph and know whether or not a main effect is likely or an interaction is likely? Well, we're going to learn. We're going to practice it a lot next time. Next class is really important not to miss because we're going to do a lot of practicing stuff in there that's not all covered in the book. So if you're not there, and you, for some reason, can't get a hold of the super awesome online videos, or it's helpful for you to be here, just make sure you're here, because learning how to do the graph analysis is important. All right, so in order to tell whether we have a main effect, or whether we have, we're likely to have a main effect, of the variable in the legend, meaning the variable that is not on the x-axis and not on the y-axis. So that's going to be whatever else is in the legend. Okay? So the legend here is alcohol to tell if there's a main effect of that variable, whatever's in the legend, you look to see how far apart the lines are. Obviously, this only works for line graphs. For bar graphs, you have to have different rules. We'll talk about bar graphs, too, next time. Today, we're just going to talk about line graphs. So to know whether or not there's a main effect, or the likelihood that you have a main effect, you look to see how far apart the lines are in the graph. The closer the lines are together, the less likely you are to have a main effect. The further apart the lines are, the more likely you are to have a main effect. And that's because this line, the bottom line, represents one condition of that variable, and the second line represents the other condition. So if the lines are really close together, that means the means for the two lines are basically the same. So they're not very different. You probably don't have a main effect. The further apart the lines are from each other, that means they're more likely to be a main, there's more likely to be a main effect. So when you look at a line graph and you're trying to figure out, is there a main effect? What's the likelihood that I've got a main effect of the variable indicated in the legend? Look to see how far apart are the lines. The further apart they are, the more likely I am to have a main effect. We're looking at the variable on the x-axis. What you want to pay attention to is the slope. A slope of zero, where the lines are flat, means no main effect. It means it doesn't matter whether you're in condition A, condition B, or condition C. It doesn't matter. The line is flat. So the averages are all the same for those lines. But the extent to which the lines slope, the more extreme the slope gets, the more likely you are to have a main effect. So I want here now to look at the slope. And these lines have some slope. So I feel like it's possible that I could have a main effect. They don't look really flat. They definitely look slopey. So yeah, I'd probably have a main effect. I can tell that there's no interaction in this graph because literally the lines do not interact with each other. When lines are parallel in a line graph, you know there's no interaction. 
And to the extent that the lines are parallel, or close to parallel, you don't have an interaction. The more the lines begin to point towards each other, or if they in fact intersect, you know you have an interaction. So when you actually see lines on a graph that cross over, guaranteed interaction, because it's crossing over. Okay, pretty much guaranteed. Not 100%, but pretty much guaranteed. Okay, depends on your power. But as the lines get closer together, you are increasing the likelihood that you've actually got an interaction. They don't actually have to cross over for you to have one, but the more and more they point towards each other, the more likely you are to get that interaction. So let's do some math again, get a different kind of graph. Okay. Look at people in the front row to the main effect of alcohol, people in the middle row to the main effect of caffeine, the people in the back row to do the interaction. Go. Front row, alcohol, middle row, caffeine, back row, interaction. TA, all of them. Be fast. You're, doing, you're trying to figure out if there's a main effect of alcohol. So you have to do the add and average and compare for alcohol. You're doing, you're doing the main effect, you're adding, averaging, and comparing, finding out what the difference is between the levels of the IV you're looking at. If you're doing the interaction, you're subtracting in the same direction. And then you're comparing what you find to see if there are any differences.
So now let's take a look at the graph for that. So here's those data graphed. So you can see now that the lines are no longer parallel. They're converging on each other as we move towards 400 milligrams. Okay, so they're far apart at zero milligrams, and they move closer and closer together at 400 milligrams. So it really visually looks like we're going to have an interaction here, or that we do have an interaction. Don't no, have an intersection, but we've got an interaction, probably. Now, you'll notice if you look at this, with the presence of this interaction, the cues that I gave you to look for main effects are now all mucky. Okay, remember, I told you, for the legend, for whatever's in the legend, in that case it is alcohol, whatever's over here, that you want to look for how far apart the lines are. Well, what does that mean in this case? Because up here, for zero milligrams, they're really far apart. But as we drink more and more coffee, they get closer and closer together. So are they far apart or not? Then, I told you for the variable on the x-axis, you want to look for the slope. How flat are the lines? Well, this one's really close to being flat, but this one's really close to not being flat. So, which one? What do we do? What are we thinking? Of course, the truth is we're thinking about the averages. What's the average distance that those lines are separated? What's the average slope of that line? And that's where the calculation for the main effects is going to come from. But the truth is that when we analyze data for factorial design, the reason we're doing a factorial design is because we're interested in whether or not we get an interaction. The interaction is the thing. That's what we really care about. And once you get an interaction, it's possible that that interaction could artificially enhance or suppress main effects of the individual independent variables. Because you're talking about variables influencing each other. Well, you, you might get something that looks like you have a main effect of IV1, but that's only because IV2 was present. If you just tested IV1 by itself, you'd never get a, a main effect. Or it could be you get something that looks like you've gotten an effect of IV2, but maybe that would never show up in the absence of IV1. If you tested IV2 all by itself, you'd never get a main effect. So in the presence of an interaction, our risk of committing type 1 and type 2 error goes up for main effects. We worry more. We have to be much more suspicious, much more cautious, much more careful in our interpretation of the main effects because we don't know how pure they are. We don't know the extent to which those main effects are appearing only because there's an interaction too, or because the two variables are showing up together. So we have to be more cautious. Now it's still interesting to look and see, for example, the direction of the effect for main effects. Might be informative about what's going on. But we want to take them with the grain of salt. We really want to focus on the interaction and what it seems to be telling us. And in the, the strongest situation, we might say that main effects are really only meaningful. We can only be confident that the main effects are really main effects if we have no interaction. Otherwise, we have to say, yeah, it's a main effect, but because of the interaction, we can't be sure that this is not reflecting a type 1 error, or we're less confident that that's the case. Now, when we do factorial analysis, it's possible to get any combination of main effects and interactions. Okay, you never know what you're going to get. You could get one or more main effects and no interaction. You could get one or more main effects and an interaction. You could get an interaction and no main effects, or you could get nothing at all. All of these are possible. 
all of them are perfectly okay outcomes. So when we're doing problems in class, if you get no effects anywhere, you know, you retain the null hypothesis for all three tests, that's okay. It happens. Okay? Or if you retain 